Thank you all for being here, and thank you for the amazing introduction. Um, so I wanted to tell you a bit about myself before um, I dive into talking about sexual assault. Um, I'm here from Los Angeles, California, uh, where I live with my fiance and my dog and my cat. Um, I'm a very stereotypical Los Angeles person. I go hiking all the time on weekends. I make my rescue pit bull wear ridiculous outfits when we walk in Venice, and I complain about traffic all the time. Um, I graduated from Harvard Law School in 2011. There, um, after quickly learning that corporate law was not for me, I studied gender and social equality. I worked as a family law student attorney and as an advocate for victims of sexual violence. Um, and I eventually ended up working at Just Detention International, an organization dedicated exclusively to ending sexual abuse in prisons and jails. I then worked briefly at the California Women's Law Center, which had a broader mission that allowed me to spend more time focusing on sexual assault in schools, as well as sexual assault at large. And I very recently took a big risk and left that job because I realized that if I'm going to continue to do this work, which I now must which I now must acknowledge is very personal to me. I need to have ultimate control over what types of projects I spend my energy on. And I need to have the time to come out and talk to groups like this. I'm here as an activist and an advocate as much as I'm here as a victim. I'm a survivor of sexual assault who has been very vocal about the processes and institutions and the rhetoric that I've come up against in the aftermath of my assault. I'm here in that capacity, not because mine is a special case, I don't think, but because it's demonstrative in significant ways of what many people go through or risk going through if they are sexually assaulted and decide to report it. If you've seen The Hunting Ground, you know the essentials of my story. You may also have seen some press about my case and the backlash that I've faced since I started speaking out. You may also have come across some mis misinformation about me and what happened to me. Fortunately, I'm not here to relitigate the facts of my case. That's been done more times than I care to think about. But for those who are less familiar, I will tell you what you need to know about me in this moment as an advocate. About six months before I graduated from Harvard Law School in 2011, a girlfriend and I were sexually assaulted by a man who was my classmate and who I thought was my friend. That alone, other than the fact that it happened at Harvard and that there were two victims that night, does nothing to set me apart from the hundreds and thousands of people who are sexually assaulted every year. In most cases of sexual assault, as you probably know by now, the assailant is not a stranger in a dark alley or an armed intruder, but it's someone who is known to the victim, someone who is in a position of trust to the victim. It makes sense, after all. Who do rapists have access to? They have access to members of their own communities, members of their own close-knit social groups, even members of their families. This is as true in our society at large as it is on college campuses, where roughly one in five women and roughly one in 33 men will be sexually assaulted while they're pursuing an education. Because we're slow to learn, though, or at least our culture is, we still feel the need to label what happens here as acquaintance rape or date rape. It's like rape light. We still treat it as if it's a separate category of rape as opposed to, you know, rape rape. Strangers with weapons, bruises and broken bones. The kind you think you could defend yourself with. Um, the kind you think you could defend yourself against with a gun or a whistle or the little blue lit emergency phones that dot our college campuses. The kind after which you would obviously immediately call 911 because it's so obvious that what we understand as a sexual crime has been committed. We all know that that is rape. But what happened to me is also rape. What happens to more than 80% of victims is also just that. You can call it date rape, acquaintance rape, friend rape, or whatever. But if you want to be part of the solution, please just call it rape. Um, but I digress. So back to my story. I was sexually assaulted by someone I knew. Again, that is typical. Where my story begins to diverge from the norm is when I decided, with my friend, the other victim, to report the assault, both to the police and to campus authorities. This was an incredibly difficult decision for so many reasons, and one that we knew would change our lives as much as, if not more than, the assault itself. 
We also knew that our decision to report would derail our lives at least as much as it would his. So I understand why 60 to 85 percent of assaults go unreported. Um, I'm going to tell you a bit about where I was when we decided to report, just so that you understand. And um, yeah, if the way that I talk about sexual assault here makes anyone uncomfortable, please feel free to get up and take some time for yourself. I won't be offended. Um, so imagine coming home to your cozy apartment after a fun night of partying with good friends. You had a great time, but you're tired. So tired that you feel ill. So ill that you feel like you may have had too much to drink, but later you might consider whether you had been drugged. Imagine being so out of it that you wake up because you can't breathe, because you think you might have begun to vomit in your sleep, and you realize it's not vomit in your mouth, but it's someone's tongue. It's your friend's tongue. You realize that you're struggling to breathe because his body, about twice your body weight, is on top of you, pressing into you. Imagine trying to make sense of the world. In that moment, processing the terrifying and baffling unknown, whether and how this might be the beginning, middle, or end of a sexual encounter that you weren't even awake to submit to. And that was just the beginning of my nightmare. So if we fast forward for a couple of hours, now I got to confront all the ways in which I was not a perfect victim, which I, will, which I knew I would have to explain if I reported. I drank, and I did drugs, and I danced promiscuously when I was out with friends before the assault. During the assault, I didn't bite or kick or scream or fight back, but that's because I didn't know what was happening. I was barely conscious. And at that point, I didn't know this man, my friend, as a potential monster. I knew him as a good friend, as one of my favorite people, actually, someone who I could let my guard down around. I didn't call the police immediately, but then, again, I didn't understand what had just happened. In the hours and even days afterward, I struggled to wrap my head around it, to reconcile the friendship that I thought I had and the sense of security in my home and with my peers that I had felt with the thing that I woke up to happening to me. I did end up reporting, and I dealt with recurring nightmares and panic attacks in addition to having to explain over and over for years why I didn't do more to fight, why I let myself get comfortable enough to be assaulted by a friend in the first place, why I didn't call the police immediately, why I look more angry than sad when I talk about it, even though we know sobbing women are rarely deemed credible witnesses. All the while, I had to remind myself, it's not my fault, it's not my fault, even when it feels like everyone and everything is insisting that it is. All of that could have been avoided if those responsible for the adjudication processes, the investigation, or those who task themselves with the role of commentator or policymaker regarding how these processes play out, if any of those people had the most basic elementary understanding of trauma in the context of sexual assault. So I'm here because I'm among the minority of sexual assault victims who reported the assault, both to my school and to the police, and exhausted both processes. My school found my assailant responsible and his actions worthy of the sanction of expulsion. And I had a positive experience with law enforcement. They believed me. They treated me respectfully and with compassion. And the district attorney believed me and decided to press charges. Again. All of these are incredibly rare outcomes, victories, if you will, for survivors of sexual assault. And then I was let down. My school conducted a year-long secret appeals process without informing or involving me, which resulted in my assailant being readmitted without so much as a disciplinary blemish on his transcript. In the criminal case, the grand jury returned indictments for the assaults that I witnessed, but not those that were inflicted on me. After an incredibly painful and drawn out trial and an entire four years down the line, he was convicted of a misdemeanor that didn't make sense given a few month, and given a few months probation. He'll be graduating from Harvard Law this summer, I expect. Meanwhile, my school itself has been silent about what went wrong in its process, which the Office of Civil Rights forced it to change as a result 
of my Title IX complaint, which was joined with others. There's been no apology, no acknowledgement of wrongdoing. It's like I don't exist to the administration. I spoke out in the hunting ground about what happened there, about what went wrong, because it's unacceptable and no school should be above accountability. And then 19 of my for former Harvard Law professors teamed up with my assailant's defense attorney and crisis PR firm, believe it or not, as well as, as, well as a few notorious rape-denying journalists, and decided to further degrade me in what I can only imagine is an effort to put me in my place. And again, through my tears, I've decided to fight back. I wrote an open letter addressing those professors, which is now making the rounds in the media. I've also written an open letter to one of the journalists who attacked me, who's notorious for addressing campus sexual assault with nuanced thoughts such as, college women, stop getting drunk. I'm tired and I'm hurt, and this is hard for me, but I do it in part for myself to reclaim what was taken from me that night and to combat the shame that these people keep trying to hurl back at me and at all survivors who see bits of their own stories in mine. The shame is not ours to keep. I do this because every day I meet survivors who tell me how devastated they were by the attacks that I've endured, many from my own professors, because they feel attacked themselves and how the strength that I've shown makes them feel strong and empowered. So why am I telling you all of this? It depends on who's listening and why. I'm here as a cautionary tale for anyone who thinks that they can get by relying on the silence of victims of sexual violence or who attempts to impose that silence with their loud and misplaced skepticism. I'm here as a victim of sexual assault who is a person who wants you to see that I'm a person, that we are all real people, and we find many, many ways to be brave and to survive in spite of the hurt that we carry. I'm here so that you understand that this is not an issue of hypersensitive victim girls and misunderstood horny boys. People are complicated, but sexual assault is not. Sexual assault is fairly straightforward. People don't have trauma reactions to bad sex. People don't risk their education, careers, reputation, and well-being reporting regretted sex, whatever that is, or frisky misunderstandings. Most people don't report rape when it happens to them because their communities and the systems that they're supposed to trust have not earned that trust. I'm here to let survivors know that they're not alone and that there is as much strength in being vocal like I have been as there is strength in silence. There is strength in silence. And those responsible for this community and for all communities need to respect that silence, the silence of 60 to 85 percent of rape survivors, the silence of the people who surround you every day as you interact with the issue of sexual assault, professionally or socially. We know we all might be safer if every victim or every survivor would speak out, report, and force institutions to recognize, if nothing else, our sheer numbers. We also know how unsafe it is for many to speak out in most, if not all, circumstances. So as much as we want to see change in our culture and in our laws and in our institutions, we cannot put the burden of advancing that change on the backs of victims of sexual violence alone. I want to see a day when we don't have to speak out in order for people to care about the issue, when we don't have to lay ourselves bare to acknowledge our pain and our trauma so publicly in order to prove that it's real. I know that that's where we are, and I'm glad that I'm able to do this work, but we have to strive to do better. To those who doubt that sexual assault is an epidemic, who are more worried about the mythologically ubiquitous but actually rare false reporting than the pain caused by the very real rapes that are happening every day, I ask those people in particular to respect the silence of survivors who surround us. They may not be as loud or as publicly demanding as I am, but they are here. And it's everyone's responsibility to make this place and all places safe for them because they are your community. As professionals, as academics, as policymakers, it is your responsibility to make sure that our laws are worthy of survivors' faith, to make sure that our systems of adjudicating these cases are worthy of the trust of victims of sexual assault 
that our community is worthy of the trust and engagement of victims of sexual assault. If you don't believe or take the word of those of us who do speak out, then it's on you to create an environment and systems in which other survivors may come forward. It makes me very sad how many people in positions of authority seem more focused instead on gaining the trust of those who may be accused of rape, who are 92 to 98% of the time actual rapists. We all want fair, reliable, adjudicative processes, and it's misleading to promote the idea that only those who defend the accused care about due process. If I report a sexual assault that actually happened, like most people who report sexual assaults, I want, the, I want an investigation that is thorough. I want a decision that is meaningful, that will stick, a decision that makes sense. These are attainable goals. This is not champions for reason and due process versus crazy, hypersensitive social justice warriors. It is possible for everyone to use our education, our privilege, and our intelligence alongside compassion and a moral compass. You can be objective or rational while acknowledging the hardships of others. In fact, I think that's the only way that anything like objectivity can be obtained from our ivory towers. For everyone in this room, regardless of whether or not you have been sexually assaulted, I hope you know that this is your fight. This is your work to do. This work is devoting your time, your energy, or resources to ending sexual violence and promoting a culture of respect. It's listening to and acknowledging survivors and encouraging others in your life to doing the same. It's getting out of bed every day as a survivor and acknowledging your pain and embracing your anger when it's productive. Sexual abuse and harassment concern everyone, could happen to anyone, and an environment that fails to properly address it makes everyone less safe. Know that as you incorporate this work into your lives to whatever extent, we all deserve to be safe. We all deserve to be treated with respect and dignity and to have our rights respected as equals among our peers. Whether you're a student, whether you're a policymaker, whether you're a professor, you deserve to know that if you are violated, the institutions you're supposed to place your trust and faith in are worthy of that trust. Students deserve to know that reporting a sexual assault, if it should ever happen to them, and if they decide that reporting is what they want to do, that this will not be a journey of martyrdom and self-sacrifice. Students deserve a less than one in five or a one in 33 chance of being sexually assaulted while trying to get an education. Students deserve a community that won't turn on them or treat them as a traitor if they ever do have to disclose their wounds as proof of that, of that community's shortcomings. I'm happy to do this work, but I hope that one day I won't have to. Thank you all for having me and for listening. Thank you. Uh, let's throw it open to questions, if anybody has a question after that very powerful uh, presentation. Uh, yes, the microphone coming right at you. I'm shocked at the gender mix here tonight. When you go around speaking, is it similar to this group? And why do you think males are avoiding listening to this topic? That's a great question. Um, I actually hadn't noticed because I'm so used to being surrounded by women when I talk about sexual assault. <laughs> um, and I think, it's, I think it's something that is easy for men to shy away from. Um, it's easy for people who don't have personal experiences with it to think, this isn't my issue. I'll leave that to the others. Um, but we really do have to acknowledge that it's everyone's issue. Everyone knows someone who's been sexually assaulted. And the people who are most able, most empowered to change the culture that enables it are men. Um, so I do wish we had more men here. But you can go and spread the word. Alex, you got a question, right? First off, 
I just want to thank you so much. It was a very powerful personal story that you shared, and I think we are connected by our stories, and so I thank you for sharing your story. Um, thank you. The question I had was just kind of a question of context and maybe a question more of uh, hopefulness, I guess, or, or your sense of it. If you look at the framework of sexual assault responses on college campuses today, do you have a sense that it is, and it may be a weird question, but better or more hopeful today than what it has been in recent years, given the news of this, the awareness of this, the pushback of this within campus communities? Or do you feel that it is less strong or less capable today than what it has been in recent years? Kind of, kind of looking for hope here, I guess. In, in, in the, uh, in the <laughs> I appreciate that, um, and I do think that things are better. I think that um, by virtue of where we are right now, this political and cultural moment where people are actually discussing sexual assault is kind of unprecedented. And that, in and of itself, um, helps these processes work better. And I appreciate that schools are paying a lot more attention to these policies. Um, but we still have such a long way to go. You know, what are, what are new policies without the necessary top-down institutional cultural change to actually implement them? Um, and that's what, that's what I worry is being left behind as um, schools strive to make themselves good on paper, um, that they may not actually be addressing their cultures. But we're moving in the right direction, I think. Yes, question. I want to also thank you for coming and bringing your story. Um, the Clinton School uh, has, has had several presentations in this vein, uh, and I'm always as the first gentleman said, I'm always amazed at how few people turn out for it. Um, when we have politics or sports or something, you know, it's standing room only. I'm ranting on Facebook on why, why aren't we out here learning and showing solidarity and support um, for people that are brave enough to address, address this issue. But the even bigger uh, elephant in the room that doesn't ever get talked about, I asked a question to Becca, who was here before uh, with her um, presentation is how are we gonna raise uh, boys? And it happens in, in the Middle East, it happens in India and South America and here, although we're really good at covering it up. Uh, how are we gonna raise boys not to do this? Because it's pre 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 predominantly males who are carrying out this predatory um, activity. And I know I raise my boys to, to value their sisters and, and other women, but we don't talk about how do we raise uh, the next generation of boys to, to value the women around them. Yeah, thank you, that's a great question. And I think um, you started to answer your own question. We really need to teach boys to value women and value, um, value others in general. Um, there's, there's this strong cultural message today that it is okay if not expected for men to objectify um, people they're sexually attracted to. And that has to stop. And I think maybe it starts with more comprehensive sex education that actually discusses consent um, and what that should look like rather than, you know, sex is something that you go get and then when you get it, this is how it works, you know? I think that, um, yeah, I think we need to educate our boys starting at a younger age and our girls too. Well, um, my original question was similar to hers, but I do have a follow-up question. Um, and my name is Sochi Delgado. I'm a first-year Clinton School student. Um, so going along the lines of how do you raise boys that will value women um, in situations where the, you're in a space where somebody's making um, a joke based on women or gender and in many instances where I've called the person out for saying that's a sexist joke, that's not appropriate, I get called um, a curmudgeon old lady or yeah. um, a fun kill. How do you handle a situation like that? 
Um, I mean, that's why we need more male allies, because, you know, if another guy steps up instead of laughing at the joke or just quietly kind of averting his eyes, they're not going to call him like a super sensitive old lady. Um, yeah, and so it really takes, and like I've had to acknowledge in doing this work that I can't fight every fight. Um, you know, and some people just won't listen to me and it's not worth expending my energy trying. Um, and that, that's why it's all the more important that we have male allies who commit to this work. Um, and one um, kind of laborious analogy is um, the emancipation of slaves. What would that movement have been without the help of white abolitionists? Um, and I think, I mean, I think the same message is true in many movements. You can't just count on the oppressed to dig their own way out. I have a question right here. Yes, ma'am. Well, can we get, we're going to get the microphone to you. Thank you for coming to Little Rock. I have a two-fold question. One is, um, I'm a clinical psychologist. And um, I'm always concerned about uh, the support that uh, advocates who take on these kinds of issues have in um, launching this work. Mm -hmm. uh, what type of support did you have? I um, get the impression that you have a strong inner core, uh, but even those with strong inner cores need some type of support doing this work. That's the first part of my question. Mm -hmm. Secondly, are you um, contacting or are other uh, institutions of higher education open and receptive to your presentations? Because a lot of this, of course, happens um, in colleges and universities. Yes. Um, to answer the first question, I feel blessed to have um, incredibly supportive family and friends. and. Um, I don't think I would have even made it through the reporting process without them. Um, and in doing this work, this kind of advocacy, um, you build a network of people who are going through the same thing and we learn how to support each other, um, which has been um, something really wonderful that I've discovered since I started speaking out publicly. Um, and to answer your second question, um, the hunting ground has been screened at thousands of colleges and universities, and they are continuing to show it, which I think is incredible. Um, and I am, I have been speaking at campuses, and I am happy to continue going because, I mean, as you know, it makes a difference. You know, seeing a film versus interacting with someone from it in person helps um, drive home the message and make it real. So. Right, 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 back here. Um, thank you for coming and sharing your story. I'm a 18-year-old girl, and I'm about to go to college in the fall. And I have two questions. One, how should I properly protect myself for the next four years? And secondly, what do you think are the specific, um, I guess you could say, requirements for proper consent if both people are under the influence? Oof. <laughs> Way to ask the tough questions. Um, so for your first one, what you can do to protect yourself. That's, you know, it's difficult for me to answer. And parents ask me that all the time. Um, how can I make sure my daughter is safe? And, um, you know, of course, there are lots of things that you can and should do. Um, people talk a lot about situational awareness, watching your drink. You, of course, will surround yourself with people you trust. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I think bottom line is knowing that you deserve to be respected and that you deserve friends who will look out for you and support you no matter what. Um, and a second way to protect oneself is really paying it forward and um, intentionally engaging with the issue of sexual assault in a way that makes clear that you're part of a culture that listens to and believes survivors because that kind of silence um, 
the, or the reluctance to believe survivors, that is what sexual predators rely on. Um, otherwise, I mean, yeah, I can't say that I have many tricks because, um, yeah, sometimes it's hard to avoid, you know, sometimes you trust people and you trust the wrong people and it happens. Um, and it's something that, it's a question that I can never ask in a way that really feels satisfying because it's hard to answer in a way that like dozens of survivors I know um, wouldn't relate to as things that they've tried to do. Um, and ultimately you just have to know that it's no, never somebody's fault when they've been sexually assaulted. Um, it's always solely the responsibility of the perpetrator. Um, and um, your second question, sexual consent between two people who are intoxicated. I might have to pass that one or punt it to anyone. <laughs> Any, yeah, yeah, I mean. Uh, here's the mic, yeah, go ahead. Well, um, we work at a rape crisis center in Fayetteville and Arkansas law is that the person who you're having sex with um, is unable through mental incapacitation or any other reason to not give consent. And alcohol is the number one rape, um, or what we like to call drug facilitated assault drug. And it matters not. We don't, we don't say, oh, we're gonna forgive the drunk driver for running over those people, because you know they were drunk and they really didn't know what they were doing, right? Same is true with alcohol. If you really want consent, don't be drinking and getting it. Because you're both under the influence, neither one. But it's the perpetrator's fault, no matter what. Thank you. Marcia, do you have a question right here? My name is Marcia Stewart. I'm a student at the Clinton School. Thank you for coming. But my, I'm quite curious about the um, Harvard undergrad campus. Have you had any um, other survivors reach out to you at the undergrad level? And have you been able to share your story on campus? Um, I have not spoken at the college, but um, I have been in touch with two incredibly brave survivors from Harvard College who have both recently gone public, um, Ariane Letalian and Alyssa Leder. Alyssa Leder is um, now suing Harvard College, and Ariane wrote this viral essay a few, I think last year or the year before, called Dear Harvard, You Won. Um, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend reading it. And um, she's also written a follow-up essay in the forthcoming book called We Believe You, uh, which is a collection of survivors' stories. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's a huge problem on the Harvard undergrad campus. I don't remember the results of the last survey, but they were really alarming, something like 30% of female students. Um, or it was a very high number. Um, and yeah, and there are also issues among the faculty. I mean, and that's what I mean by like top-down culture change. They have these fancy new Title IX apologies, but from the administration at the law school and in the college, there's been no acknowledgement of how badly they've gotten it wrong in the past, um, which makes one question their commitment to really doing things better, whether they're just saving face. and. Um, yeah, if the culture is going to change, there needs to be institutional buy-in, not just covering one's bases. And I think the, the students, um, those that I've talked to at Harvard Law, um, and the few college students I know are very aware of that disparity and um, you know, feel a little bit gaslighted by the, the new policies without cultural follow-through. Hello. Um, I have a question regarding um, your advice you could give to survivors that are either here in this room with us or those that are not for uh, what has helped you to move on mm -hmm. and um, what can you give as far as advice goes to those that have also survived um, through this instance? That's a great question. Um, if I could do one thing differently, in the aftermath of my assault, I would, um, I would let myself grieve um, 
And, and, and I mean, it was my way of survival, pushing through, not giving myself time to feel the pain because frankly, I was afraid of what would happen if I did. Um, and it's still been um, a challenge for me, and I see that with a lot of other survivors. You know, it's been a year, it's been two years, I can't believe I'm not over this. Um, and so I would say to all survivors, be patient with yourself and be kind to yourself the same way you would be for a friend who was going through something like that. Um, there is no hurrying up and healing. Um, you're, not, you're not broken, and the assault does not define you. But it does stay with you for a while in different ways, and it gets smaller as you grow farther away from it. But um, you have to give yourself time to heal. And like, you know, I'm up here speaking and I'm being strong, but I still have those days when I can't get out of bed. And I used to beat myself up over them, you know, like, you gotta be strong, you gotta do this. And now I'm just like, it's okay. This is what's gonna happen. And I'm gonna stay in bed and binge watch The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt on Netflix <laughs> and you know then tomorrow will be a new day and you just yeah you just have to let yourself feel question right there you said that you were part of a Title IX lawsuit with Harvard is that correct? Um, a Title IX complaint okay I guess. Um, and that you all won it or I, I'm not really sure what is involved in a Title IX lawsuit and what winning one means to a college campus? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I won. Um, so there, um, a student can file a lawsuit, a civil Title IX lawsuit, um, which is a civil rights lawsuit, or you can do what I did, which was, or you can do both, or you can file um, a complaint, and this was a civil rights complaint with the Office of Civil Rights. Um, which is responsible for overseeing and enforcing Title IX in federally funded educational institutions. So that's what I did. Um, and filing a Title IX complaint with OCR can be as simple as like scribbling down on a post-it what happened and where, um, or how the school messed up. Um, and there, I think, we've heard the number and it keeps growing. I know it's way over 100 schools currently being investigated by the Office of Civil Rights. Um, so there usually be an investigation, and that can take a very long time um, because OCR is um, actually a pretty small office. And, um, and then they'll make findings. And um, so in the case with Harvard Law, um, they found that the school's pro practices and policies were unequal, and they um, unfairly favored the accused. And so um, while there's the overarching threat of losing federal funding, um, that has never happened um, yet. But um, they'll give the schools an opportunity to reform their policies, to change them for the better, and then there will often be, that will be followed by a period of monitoring. So that's where Harvard Law is now. Um, and so by successful Title IX complaints, I mean that um, I complained about what I saw as a flawed process, and um, the Office of Civil Rights confirmed that and found that my school was in violation of Title IX. Oh, I just forgot my question. Um, so I also went to a school that has dealt with certain issues like this, um, and I was just curious to see like, what you thought why you thought universities are so dedicated to saving face and looking good versus defending their students? Um, and what, I don't know if you even know the answer to this, um, what do you think the benefits are for them at the core of their admission world? Um, what benefit you see to them doing, like taking that route where they're saving their looks yeah. um, versus saving their students that they originally accepted as their own? That's a great question. Um, I've lost sleep over it. <laughs> and. Um, I think ultimately, when I first, before the hunting ground came out even, and I was trying to make sense of my school's actions, um, it was hard for me, because I thought, sure, you could deny that, there's, that there are any rapists here, um, but that means keeping a rapist on campus and potentially subjecting more of your students to rape. Um, or you can acknowledge that rape does happen here because rape happens everywhere and you can actually address it and support survivors. 
Um, and I still don't understand, like, it, it seems pretty easy. <laughs> you know, I mean, not easy, but it seems pretty straightforward. But, um, well, there are a lot of reasons. One, I think that um, there are just some misplaced values. Two, I think that they're more afraid of lawsuits from um, accused students who have been, um, who have faced discipline than they are from survivors and complainants. Um, and often that's because we burn out. <laughs> um, and yeah, you know, I'm just not sure, but I think their values are all wrong. And um, there's much more to be gained from actually supporting survivors and addressing a problem that everybody knows is there rather than. I know there may be more questions, but I hope you will come visit with her personally. What a powerful presentation we've had. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.